Hi, and welcome back to the Business Career College video series. We are going to, in this video, continue talking about financial planning for business owners. And we're on to now the uh, uh, 33rd video, number 33 in the series. We're on disability uh, by cell and rolling along nicely here. With what we've looked at entirely to this point, really, when we've looked at these mechanics behind buy-sell arrangements has been the death of a shareholder, but we shouldn't limit our considerations to death of a shareholder. We can also think about disability or serious illness. This can be potentially um, as difficult to deal with. The challenge from a tax perspective here is that the, um, payout from a life insurance policy creates a CDA credit where the payout from a disability or critical illness insurance policy does not create a CDA credit. Only life insurance creates a CDA credit. It is possible here just to use, and I'm going to show this example in a few minutes, just to use a non-grandfathered share redemption and just use a taxable dividend. That's one way to do this. We can also, as we'll see in a minute, use a trust or a cross-purchase arrangement. So hang on to that thought. Um, a problem here though, is that the insurance is far more expensive. Living benefits insurance, as anybody who's uh, sold these products knows, is quite a bit more expensive per dollar of coverage than life insurance. We have a further set of problems here where disability insurance can have some really difficult definitions. So there are structured, a couple of companies in Canada have structured disability buy sell products, but the definitions here can be quite challenging actually. And you'll see down at the bottom here that what sometimes happens is you have somebody who has a condition where a claim could be paid or will be paid, but the shareholder may not even want to sell in those circumstances. And I've chosen blindness here. I'm sure we can imagine circumstances where a shareholder of a corporation goes blind but is able to continue to operate in that business. And the buy-sell really should talk about, hey, what happens here if we have a shareholder who doesn't want to be bought out? What happens with the money? Does it stay in the corporation? Do we keep it on reserve? Do we force that person to sell their shares anyways? What's the solution here? And another problem here, this is okay for smaller businesses, Trashco is fine here at the values we've been using, but what if we have, sorry, if we have a larger business, then a $2 million limit is actually a pretty common living benefits uh, maximum issue. And if you have larger values, you might have to go to an alternate insurance solution. You might have to go to uh, specialty risk markets, or you might have to go to maybe American markets in some cases, although that's a tough one to access sometimes, but we want to find some way to, uh, to deal with this if we get over $2 million per shareholder. Okay, so cross-purchase would be um, really pretty simple, nothing we haven't seen before here, where, for example, uh, Connie is just going to carry a million dollars of, let's say for the sake of argument, CI on each of uh, Bruce and Allen. And then Bruce has the same thing. Bruce has a million dollars on each of Allen and Connie. And Alan has a million dollars on each of Bruce and Connie. Nothing fancy here. Pretty expensive. We're really maintaining six different critical illness insurance policies. And we'll be paying a hefty premium here, owing to the fact that this is an awful lot of risk that an insurer is taking on. If somebody does get sick, then we just have a death benefit paid. It could also be a disability insurance policy. The benefit will be paid to whoever is not sick, and they will use that money to buy out the surviving shareholder, just like the cross-purchase arrangements that we've previously seen.
Now, one of the problems with that type of arrangement, let's say for the sake of argument that Bruce gets sick and then Connie gets that million dollars, and at the same time, Alan gets the million dollars, well, we're really counting on their behavior here. We're really counting on Alan and Connie to follow the terms of the unanimous shareholders agreement. And if they don't, then really the only recourse here is for Bruce or whoever his representative is to sue Alan and Connie to take them to civil court. And that might not be ideal. So some people prefer to use a trust here, to have the policies all owned via a trust. And we could actually do this, this would be perfectly fine, where basically Trash Co pays premiums into a trust. Now those premiums will be a taxable benefit to Alan, Bruce, and Connie, Basically, we're going to have a little bit of tax complexity around that. Not too bad. As if they had taken the dollars out themselves and bought the insurance themselves. The difference here is that now we're going to have a trustee to take care of this. If any benefit is paid out, it's paid into the trust and the trustee can basically facilitate the payment of funds or the flow of funds here. And this reduces the risk now that Alan or Connie does something a little bit unusual. Because now we have the trustee essentially managing the flow here we can even use a, a note. The trust could write a note. Connie and Alan could use the note to buy out Alan or to buy out Bruce, sorry, or his heirs or his uh, representative or whatever. And then the notes could be redeemed. We don't even necessarily have to flow cash this way. So this becomes a little bit of a cleaner arrangement. It has exactly the same tax outcome as if we had used the cross purchase method. We just have a little bit more certainty. And another solution here that we can possibly enter into is share redemption. Now there are a couple of different ways to do share redemption. So the first would be just the traditional share redemption. Where we have a non-grandfathered share redemption, and if we have the non-grandfathered share redemption, it's going to be exactly what I showed earlier. We're going to pay a fully taxable dividend to the recipient of the buyout, whoever's having their shares bought out. That person is gone. Oh yeah, I totally forgot about Darren here too. I meant to mention Darren earlier. Darren's long since forgotten. You might recall that we used Darren earlier to buy some shares, but uh, yeah, sorry, Darren. We really used him and just discarded him. Um, so anyways, the, uh, the fully taxable dividend, that's going to look exactly like the non-grandfathered share redemption that I showed before. Now there is a slight variation on this that we can see, although it's quite difficult to do this now. And this would be done where we have hold cos in place. So we could have, Each shareholder owns their shares of Trash Co. through a Hold Co. We could go that route and then have the Hold Co's own the insurance. Or what's more likely is that Trash Co. owns the insurance. And if Trash Co. owns the insurance now, it receives the death benefit, or sorry, the living benefit, whatever it is, the CI or DI payout. And what it wants to do here is pay a tax-free intercorporate dividend 
to the hold co for the sick person, whoever it is that had the claim paid on their behalf, and do a share redemption that way. This used to work fairly well. The problem we would have with this now is that we have these what are called safe income rules, and the safe income rules may prevent this from working. Guess what? This is another situation where we have to lean on our tax professional. We may even need a tax lawyer to make sure that we can navigate the safe income rules. The point with the safe income rules is really that you can only pay a tax-free intercorporate dividend to the extent that you have after-tax dollars available in your corporation. And unfortunately, your critical illness insurance benefit doesn't create a credit to your safe income account, so you don't necessarily have the ability to pay this out tax-free, which you once did prior to 2016. Those safe income rules were uh, not in place, or they were a lot um, more generous, and we could, uh, we could pull this off. Today, if you're going to do this kind of thing, you really do need uh, your tax professional quite heavily involved. So it may be easier just to use the cross-purchase or the trust arrangement. That being said, talk to the tax professional, see what you can do here in light of safe income rules. Also, this only really works well if I have three holding companies in place, which we may or may not have. All right, I hope that helps. I hope you enjoy your continued studies and thank you very much. Hi and welcome back to the Business Career College video series. Uh, in this video, we're going to continue our discussion around financial planning for business owners. Just give a quick second here for our commercial. I haven't done this in a while. Again, I will remind you that Business Career College offers a range of different courses, the LLQP. Uh, we deliver the courses leading to the uh, CFP uh, designation. We have a lot of continuing education options for those who need it. The Elder Planning Counselor and a few other odds and ends as you'll see on the page here. Okay, we're on to now freezing. We're on video number 34. And I'll just take a second here. We're really going to, from video 34 to 38, be dealing with what is more of a almost personal or estate planning situation. It's relevant for business owners, but it does take us a little bit outside of the, sorry, down to melt thaw. Um, it does take us a little bit outside of kind of Trashco and more into the lives of the shareholders of Trashco, mostly about retirement and estate planning. Um, it's certainly something that affects business owners a lot. It's something we absolutely will deal with for business owners. I just want to sort of acknowledge that we're making this shift in our approach here or shift in the type of material we're going to be covering. Okay, this word gets used all the time an estate freeze, and what is an estate freeze? Well, the idea here is simply that we're going to freeze the value of your estate, just like the name implies. And it's really a way to address the concern, what will my tax liability at death be? And this is a common problem that we see as sort of an introductory problem on the life insurance side. You've got a client who has some asset that is appreciating in value, and you know it's going to generate a capital gain at death, and we simply want to find a way to take that capital gain off the table. We can do all kinds of freezes here. Some are very simple. The simplest freeze is just to give stuff away. Hey, if I give stuff away, I'll maybe have some tax liabilities now, but I won't have tax liabilities at death. Now, the problem with giving everything away is presumably you still need to pay the bills so you maybe don't want to get too aggressive with this strategy. We can certainly see more complex freezes here. We can use a trust as part of a freeze. What is very common, and what we're going to see in the next video, will be the use of a corporation as part of a freeze. We'll look at both a Section 85 and a Section 86 freeze here. 
the question when we're looking at any sort of freeze is what assets are still going to be needed? Who are the intended beneficiaries of that freeze? What relationship does the freezer have to the intended beneficiaries? And what are we looking at in terms of freeze assets? Farming and fishing assets, as we saw in an earlier video, have tons of flexibility. Private corporation shares a little bit tougher. They're not so easy to deal with, but certainly they can be made to work here. And actually most of the next four videos will deal with uh, private corporation shares primarily. So here's a simple freeze. Now, I would emphasize that this is something that does quite often come from the financial planner or the advisor. Sometimes this introduction or this introduced by the accountant, sometimes by the estate lawyer, but it's quite often the insurance advisor who sort of has the first look at this and says, hey, you know that there's going to be this big capital gain at death. And yeah, I can sell you a big fat permanent insurance policy to deal with some of that, but maybe we don't need to rely solely on a permanent insurance policy to accomplish this. Now, I'm going to show a nice easy freeze. So we're gonna go back to Bruce, and let's say and we have Bruce married to Bonnie here, and Bruce has long since sold the shares of Trashco, okay? So we don't have Trashco in the mix anymore. Bruce has some registered assets, Bonnie has some registered assets. There's also some non-registered assets, a house and a cottage. And the problem here is that some of these things are appreciating assets, and the appreciating assets could create some tax liabilities for us. Now, this is where we really do have a whole robust tax discussion to have. But let's say that uh, Bruce and Bonnie are both still sort of long-term investors, and they're investing, they have their appreciating assets growing, okay? And we know that that creates a sort of uncertain tax liability. The house also an appreciating asset and the cottage also an appreciating asset. So they wanna do a freeze. Well, maybe they look at the cottage and for example, the cottage might have an ACB of let's say $250,000 and they say, well, let's get that thing out of here. We don't know how much growth it's going to have. We're going to end up passing that to our daughter, Kaylee, anyways, at some point. We trust her. We figure she's going to do the right thing with this. So we just gift her the cottage right now. And we might consider that a freeze, or at least it's not creating any sort of tax liability for them. Now, RSPs, we know they're going to have to riff these one day. And this is where I would suggest we probably aren't too concerned at about an increasing tax liability. A couple of reasons for that. This will be, first off, there'll be a spousal rollover on first death. And then on second death, uh, lots of liquidity here. Should be no problem at all paying whatever tax bill is associated with the RSP. And then, of course, the longer you live, the less a problem this is because your uh, minimum withdrawals will reduce the value of the RSP or what will be a RIF as you age. So this is actually generally not a big freeze issue. Uh, the house, we're probably not too concerned with because we will end up using the principal residence exemption. It really only leaves the non-registered assets. Now, the nice thing with the non-registered assets is that this is a piece of fungible property. That is, we can break it up. You don't have to worry about a lack of liquidity. It's not like shares in a corporation or a cottage where it's not so easy to break up. This, these, or sorry, shares in a small business corporation, this set of non-registered assets should be easy to manage. That being said, if we have a freeze concern, there are things that can be done here. For example, maybe you hold all your non-appreciating fixed income investments here. 
And that would be something of a freeze type solution. If you have to have some fixed income in your portfolio, which most people will, then not a bad place to hold it here and simply have the uh, any growth happen in the registered plans where that might be less of a concern because of the tax advantage nature of those registered plans. So that's it, it's not a complicated tool here. All we're going to do is go through each asset. What do you need? What do you have now? How much can you pass on? Can we give that to the kids now? Do we have to wait? That's it, it becomes really more of a discussion about intangibles, about values, about objectives. The tax side of this is really uh, pretty minimal. Although you have to know your tax rules, James is certainly going to have to know his tax rules to be able to have this conversation with his clients. I hope that that helps. I hope you understand the freeze a little bit. Really, not that complicated a concept and hope you enjoy your continued studies. Thank you. And welcome back to the Business Career College video series. In this video, we're going to continue looking at financial planning for business owners. We are now on to the 35th video in the series. We're going to talk here about methods for an estate freeze, and specifically, we're going to focus on section 85 and section 86. These are often associated with freezes. Uh, the idea here is that the freezer is gonna take preferred shares at a fixed value, and the heir would take common shares, which will be an appreciating asset. So this is where the freeze comes in, because these fixed value shares, right here, this is our frozen asset. And basically what we're doing then, is we're passing the growth to the next generation. And that way we have some certainty around the capital gains liability on first death. This is especially attractive with a small business corporation's shares because there's not really an easy way to deal with this liability at death otherwise. You typically can't just sell a few shares of your small business corporation. There's not an unlimited pool of buyers out there. So this is where your shares of your small business corporation are generally not a fungible asset. They're not easily broken up into their uh, sort of smaller components. The section 85 freeze is what we would do when we want to introduce a new corporation. And this is generally the easier way to use lifetime capital gains exemption. If you don't want to introduce a new corporation or if the lifetime capital gains exemption is not available, then you're more likely to use section 86. It is possible to combine a section 86 reorganization with the use of the lifetime capital gains exemption, but you're going to have to lean a little bit more on your tax professionals to make that work. Normally when we go through the freeze, the freezer is going to walk away from this with preferred shares, but the preferred shares are going to have some specific characteristics that are typical to freeze shares. Normally these preferred shares will have a lot of voting rights. This would allow the freezer to resume control of their business. Presumably they spent their life building up the value of the business and they don't want to see it go down the toilet. So if they have an heir who's not doing a great job or who becomes disinterested, this is where the freezer might step in, exercise their voting rights, resume control of the company. We also are concerned about retirement needs here, and this is where you'll figure out what the retirement needs are for the freezer, and they'll have themselves receive a fixed dividend in that amount. And then the shares would have a redemption schedule, and then the heir can gradually reduce the freezer's interest in the company. And basically what that's going to do, that over time is going to take the freezer out of the picture and the heir's degree of ownership of the company will gradually increase. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a later presentation. I'll show you an example of that. Uh, it would be quite unusual for a company like Trashco to successfully employ an estate freeze with three different shareholders 
all in a pretty equal position, none of whom are related to each other, you would need to have three people who see everything so perfectly eye to eye. Even in family businesses, freezes can be difficult. When we have three people who are not related to one another, they might be at different stages in life, they'll have different retirement needs, they'll have different estate planning outcomes. It would be very unusual in a company like Trashco to see a freeze. Now, that being said, uh, somewhat artificially, I have introduced here a little bit of a scenario. So if we were going to do a freeze, what could happen here with Alan, Bruce, and Connie is we could simply have each of them create their own holding companies. So we'll have hold go. And hold co and hold co and then they would swap their uh, shares so each of them would probably go through the same transaction in order to make this work where Connie would swap her common shares for preferred shares and this is where this is going to get real tricky because now Connie's heir would buy her shares of Holdco, common shares here, so we're going to talk about newly issued common shares of Holdco, and we would have the same thing with Bruce's heir, and we'd have the same thing with Alan's heir. It becomes a really difficult thing to manage to get this all working cleanly where all three of them basically get exactly what they need out of this freeze. I'm sure you can see how complicated this gets. So you just normally would not see this. Normally what would have to happen here is they would just deal with their tax consequences of death each as a unique entity. That's probably your best case scenario. Okay? The other thing that I'll point out just while I have this picture up here is that with the new tax on split income rules, the tax on split income rules make this a little bit more difficult. If the heirs are working in the business, this is probably okay. But if the heirs are not working in the business, then you probably can't successfully execute a freeze that has the full tax benefits you might want. Okay, so tax on split income does make this a little bit tough. Okay, now let's look at a more typical scenario. Let's say at some point, Bruce has bought out the other three partners in Trashco. So Bruce, or the other two partners, I guess. Bruce now owns 300 common shares of Trashco. Well, here's what he might do in order to execute a freeze. So Kaylee is working in the business. She's quite interested. She's filling a management role. And she is uh, Bruce's succession plan. That is, Bruce figures that that's the right person to take over the ownership of his business. He's ready to step back a little bit. Here's what he does. He's going to take these 300 common shares and he's going to move these into a holding company. And this is done using Section 85, like we've seen previously in the video dealing with Section 85. And we know that because Bruce is using Section 85, one of the things that he gets to do here is choose his transfer price. Let's assume that he has a zero ACV, which may not be realistic given that he bought out the other two shareholders, but it's okay. Um, so he gets to choose elected transfer price of somewhere between zero and up to $6 million. Even if he had an ACV, that's still fine. He would probably have much the same type of outcome here where he's just going to use his lifetime capital gains exemption. So he probably steps up his ACV a little bit, uses that $850,000 exemption, 
And in exchange for this, he takes shares of Holdco. Now, in a later video, we'll deal with what's actually going to happen in terms of the shares Bruce takes, but we might see something like this, where Bruce takes, uh, let's say, 100 preferred shares of Holdco, and these preferred shares then will have a value of $6 million. They'll have an ACB, just based on what we've done here, of $850,000. If he had bought out the other shareholders of Trashco, he probably has a higher ACB in reality. And he's going to have a fixed dividend here. And that might be based on his retirement needs. Let's say, for example, he needs $200,000 of annual income to support his retirement. That might be the dividend that these shares are set at. It really puts the burden on Holdco to pay out, and really that transfers to Trashco, to pay out that dividend to Bruce every year. And there will be possibly some sort of redemption schedule. That's what I will deal with in a later video. And probably heavy voting rights. And now we have Holdco as the owner of Trashco. Holdco now owns the 600, sorry, 300 common shares. And it's going to have an ACB based on what it just is deemed to have paid for these shares, ACB of $850,000. And we still have Trashco down here. Trashco is worth $6 million. And now we're going to, there's a couple different ways to do this. The way that I prefer, and you'll find lots of variations on this, and that's just fine, is that we're going to have, at this point, Kaylee. Because Kaylee is Bruce's sole heir, this is generally how I would prefer to do this. I'm gonna have Kaylee buy newly issued common shares. And really, they're gonna have a nominal value here at a price of whatever, it doesn't really matter, let's say a 1,000 bucks. And that's the only value they have. They're only worth $1,000 right now. The only value these shares have is the future growth of Trashco. Because if Trashco, let's say a year from now, just for the sake of argument, Trashco is worth, let's say, $6,100,000, just a little bit of growth in that year. Well, Bruce's position is still worth $6 million. But now Kaylee's position is worth $100,000. Her position has grown. She has the appreciating common shares. In so doing now, we've created a known tax outcome on Bruce's death that eventually, we know that the sort of worst case scenario here is that Bruce has a $5,150,000 capital gain at death it wouldn't be any more than that, and that becomes a fairly easy risk to insure. Yes, it's going to be an expensive insurance policy, but it's an easy thing to do, whereas if that was an unknown value or an increasing value, it becomes much harder to do. And this works reasonably well as long as Kaylee is working in the business, and as long as she can come up with a little bit of money out of her own pocket to buy these shares, not a problem. Where this starts to get complicated is if you have people who aren't working in the business. Uh, we used to often see a family trust used to do this, and the family trust is much more difficult here under the new tax on split income rules. If Kaylee is over the age of 24, this makes this a little bit easier. If she's under the age of 25, then a little bit difficult, but if she's working in the business, it should still be okay. Okay, I hope that that uh, helps. I hope you understand the basics behind what we did here, a section 85 freeze. We've got a little bit more work to do with the freeze in the next few videos. I hope that that's helpful as well, but I hope you've uh, learned something here and I hope you enjoy your continued studies. Hi, and welcome back to the Business Career College video series. In this video, we're going to 
continue our series dealing with financial planning for uh, business owners. We are well into the series here. Uh, we're now on to video 36, the refreeze. And I know we're into the depths when we're talking about refreeze here. Okay. Uh, the question with the refreeze is what if you use the lifetime capital gains exemption and then later on it gets larger? Or even if you only use some of your lifetime capital gains exemption and then later on you have, a, you have the ability to use this again, maybe to chew up more of your exemption. And there's a strong precedent for this. The lifetime capital gains exemption has been sort of steadily increasing. It's certainly a place where governments of all colors have shown a willingness to uh, change this up a little bit to give more and more sort of um, more and more provisions here to um, to use that lifetime capital gains exemption or more opportunity to use it. Um, although you may recall from a video quite a while ago that up until 1994, you could use it on all kinds of capital gains. In 1994, that changed to only um, qualified small business corporation shares. Nevertheless, it is entirely realistic that the lifetime capital gains exemption may increase at some point in the future. Okay, let's see how this would look. We, I'm gonna simplify this a little bit. Um, we're gonna use a smaller, going to sorry, use a smaller value. We've been using $6 million here. I've bumped Trashco's value down to $2 million to make this example a little bit easier. And I'm going to assume that, and I talked about the possible limitations of this, but we're gonna assume that uh, Bruce and Connie have no problem with Alan doing a freeze. So we have the uh, provisions within the unanimous shareholders agreement for Alan to do a freeze, okay? And now we're going to have, uh, just cut Bruce and Connie out for the sake of simplicity here. And Alan does a little bit of a freeze here and he's gonna use a section 85 freeze, a fairly simple uh, section 85 freeze here. And we're gonna put in place a little holding company. Alan owns one third of this, one third of a $2 million business, that's $666,667. So Alan uses his uh, lifetime capital gains exemption and bumps up his ACB here. So it's now gonna be $666,667. That's no longer a zero ACB. We've got that, good to go. And this is all done via Alan's own personal hold co. Okay, hold co now owns 33% uh, of trash co and Alan owns 100% of hold co and whatever share structure he takes back, that's perfectly fine. So he has at this point used up a good chunk of lifetime capital gains exemption. Now, the problem here is that if the lifetime capital gains exemption should increase again later on, or if the value of trash co increases, Alan actually has sort of robbed himself of the ability to take advantage of this. So he may be better off to actually not freeze all of his shares. What if he did something like this? What if he just took $500,000 of shares and froze those and kept direct ownership of $166,000? So just uh, to simplify this, let's see here, we can do, do 75 shares that he's gonna freeze and he's gonna keep 25 shares over here, those shares are it's, uh, 25 shares. That's going to be 300 shares of Hold Co. right now. They're about $5,000 a share, $5,005 a share. It's about $125,000 of value that he sets aside over here. That's the portion that's not frozen. 
and then he's going to freeze his other 75 shares. Those will be frozen, and probably what we're going to do here is have him keep that direct ownership. Here, we're probably going to do a section 86 and swap these out for uh, preferred shares that are gonna have fixed value, and now there's no opportunity for any future growth. And now, that's going to be about $540,000 of his capital gains exemption that Alan will have used. So that's uh, $541,000. $542 of LCG that's used. And he's sort of set himself up now where all the growth that he owns in Trashco anyways would happen within these 25 shares. This is all fixed value. So that now, let's say Trashco's value bumps up by another million dollars. Now it's worth $3 million. Well, we've basically captured about 540,000 of value within Holdco. We'll just call it 540, so I don't have to mess around with those uh, finer numbers here. And over here, that means if Alan owns a third of Trashco, and we have to have negotiated this properly to make sure that he didn't uh, shoot himself in the foot by doing this freeze here, previously, but let's assume he really does still own a third of this. Well, his, uh, and probably the way that would have to happen is that Bruce and Connie did the same type of freeze at the same time. Anyways, we have now a million dollars of value attributed to these 25 shares, and this is where the refreeze comes in. Because now, given that he owns these shares personally, this is where he can refreeze. And he would simply do another estate freeze. He might bounce those into Holdco or he might set up a new corporation. Whichever it happens to be, the fact is it's still a disposition. As long as Trashco is still a QSBC, as long as that's true, it's still, a, it's a disposition of those shares. And he's going to have a capital gain here. He's got zero ACV, he's got a capital gain of a million dollars. Whatever the lifetime capital gains exemption is, that gives him the opportunity to use the available exemption. If he did use 541,000 back here, Let's say for the sake of argument, the exemption is now a million dollars, which it's scheduled to increase to based on inflationary increases. So that would give him maybe the opportunity to use 458,458 dollars. I believe my math uh, checks out there. Um, and now he would have that much higher ACB at no further tax cost. That's the refreeze, pretty complicated measure. And the fact is though, you do see a lot of, let's say more um, planning oriented tax professionals recommend that clients do their initial freezes with the opportunity to take advantage of the uh, increases we see here. And I'll just remind you again that that is a distinct possibility. We saw back here that the lifetime capital gains exemption has been on its way up and it's not, it wouldn't be a surprise if that continued. I wanna take a second before I wrap up to give a shout out to a couple of different folks who've been really good with uh, getting these videos made. Uh, that's uh, Peter O'Neill out in St. John and Jim Sullivan out in uh, Charlottetown. Thanks very much to both of you. And I hope that everybody is enjoying the videos and has something to learn. I will see you in the next video. Thank you very much.
Hi, and welcome back to the Business Career College video series. In this video, we are continuing our discussion around financial planning for business owners. We are now on to video number 37 in the series, the partial freeze. This will be our second last freeze video. This will be a little shorter than the last few. The last few have been a little bit long. Uh, the partial freeze is the answer to the question, is the freezer giving up too much if we do a full-on freeze? If we do the absolute complete freeze, as I showed in the last video, then you might be actually giving up future growth that you actually want. It, I know that we talked about freezing with your kids before, but even then, it's your business, your stuff, whatever, and a complete freeze might not be attractive. If the freezer is still relatively young, then we might have questions about whether the uh, value of the freeze is sufficient to sustain a retirement lifestyle and potentially other lifestyle needs here as well. It might not just be retirement, depends on the age. We might even have some other estate objectives that don't involve the child who's receiving the assets as part of the freeze. And I know we've dealt with kids receiving freeze assets, but there are situations that can happen where somebody other than the kids is the chosen successor for the business. And that's where we really want to be careful about how much we're giving away. So we might be able to manage our tax bill here at death, but the value of the estate might be less. The value of the retirement income might be less. And those might adversely affect the freezer's ability to carry out their uh, financial objectives. And then uh, when the kids take on the business, there's some risk here as well. Are they going to do a good job of running the business? Uh, does the parent maybe later on regret passing control to the kids? Does the parent watch the child run the business and uh, maybe lament their decision? Uh, or do they watch the child run the business and make decisions that are contrary to what the parent would have made. These can be issues. I would suggest that the solution here isn't really a tax solution. The solution here really is that our uh, financial advisor, uh, James, should be having good, robust discussions with the client. And we'll bring James in then. One of the things that I prefer here is good communication all the way through and James should be encouraging the family meeting, make sure that everybody involved knows what they're uh, doing, what the long-term outcomes are supposed to be. We can't just focus on tax here. That's going to lead to frustration. Let's work through a partial freeze, see how this might look. And this should reduce the likelihood that uh, Bruce ends up with some sort of uh, need to unwind the freeze later on. So I showed before the complete freeze and what we had done there was that Bruce took all of his shares and froze them, all 100 shares and froze them. But let's do this a little bit differently here. Uh, as we've had previously, we'll have Bruce owning 100 shares. But in order to accomplish a partial freeze, what he might do is take maybe 80 of those shares, maybe 50 of those shares, something like that, and go through the same freeze process we saw before. So I'm gonna have Bruce still personally holding, let's say just for the sake of argument, uh, 40 shares of Trash Co. And then 60 of his shares are going to be held in, an op or in a holding company. Bring a hold co in here. And now we want to find a way for uh, Kaylee and possibly Bonnie too. It depends on how uh, the tax on split income rules work out here, but we want to find a way for uh, definitely Kaylee, possibly Bonnie, to have some opportunity to participate in future growth of the company. And maybe what we do here is have Kaylee just buy some shares from Bruce. Maybe she, she buys some of these 40 shares. Of course, we have to come to some sort of reasonable valuation here. And this is where 
we might have to break up the shares. We might have to maybe do some sort of a split here to reduce the value of the shares, but possibly uh, we can have Kaylee buy shares from Bruce or possibly uh, Kaylee buys maybe some newly issued uh, common shares of Holdco here and those would be uh, appreciating shares. Or sorry, yeah, of Holdco, that's right. It's probably the easiest way to do this and this is what's going to um, give Bruce a little bit of a freeze characteristic here. So Bruce now is going to hold uh, preferred shares. Uh, Holdco, and we might have both uh, Bonnie and Kaylee, assuming we can do this in a way that does not uh, wreck the Tossy outcomes, which we went over previously. Maybe they both buy some new common shares. And now with both of them owning common shares, there's some of the growth of trash co that happens here. But Bruce has the advantage here that he still has a fairly significant amount of uh, control owing to the 40 shares of trash code that he owns that would allow him to exercise direct control uh, these preferred shares of hold co likely also have voting rights that would supersede any of the common shares the newly issued common shares associated with hold co gives him a little bit more flexibility uh, you can see it's a little bit more complicated we really have to think about whether this is the desired outcome and if I were in Kaylee's shoes here, I might not like this too much. I might say, look, if you want me to run the business, if you want me to take over your business, then why don't we just go that route? Or maybe we brought Kaylee on earlier and she just bought some shares, bought some common shares, maybe through a capital injection into Trash Co. or just buy shares off of Bruce. And then we have a little bit more flexibility. Sort of tricky to do the partial freeze here when we haven't uh, planned things out a little bit more in advance. Okay, I hope that's good. I hope you can see why we would use the partial freeze. It does give Bruce a little bit more flexibility, but I'm not sure how often you'll see this uh, outcome in real life. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy your continued studies. Hi, and welcome back to the Business Career College video series. In this video, we're going to be continuing our uh, series dealing with financial planning for business owners. We're now on to video number 38 in the series, and this video is going to deal with the uh, melt and thaw. And this wraps up our series dealing with freezes, our mini series here dealing with freezes. This will be the last one. I guess it's kind of appropriate to end with a melt and thaw here. That's way to end the freeze. These terms, melt and thaw, these are completely arbitrary terms. Melt, really in this case, also referred to as a wasting freeze, means that we're gradually reducing the freezer's ownership position. We're taking the freezer out, getting rid of their preferred shares, which will put the uh, person who acquired the shares, the succession plan, in a greater controlling position, and it reduces the company's obligations to pay dividends to the freezer. The idea is we would take that money and put it in that person's hands. They would use it to invest elsewhere and generate retirement income. Now, this is not terribly tax efficient compared to just waiting until death and dealing with capital gains then. And the reason that that's not so tax efficient is because in this case, the share redemption has to be done entirely with a taxable dividend that will have a greater tax burden than if we wait until death and do a share redemption there where we have CDA credits. But it still might be practical to do this. We still might want to get that person uh, the opportunity to divest their shares of the uh, corporation and diversify their sources of retirement income and also to pass more control onto whoever their succession plan is. <coughs> a thaw is a little bit different. In a thaw, 
the freezer is going to actually step back in. The freezer says, hey, that kid has no idea what they're doing, or hey, I think my kid has run off to whatever, Costa Rica, and I don't think they're coming back. And now the freezer says, perfect, I'm going to step in and resume control here. Now, this is done, this uh, thaw is done one of three ways. I had mentioned earlier that this person, the freezer, will normally still retain the vast majority of voting rights. They might simply exercise those voting rights, put in a board of directors that's friendly to them, probably themselves, and then resume control of the company. It might be done through a Section 86 reorganization. They might swap their preferred shares back for common shares. To do that, they probably have to be in that board of directors position anyways. And it's possible that we used a trust here to execute the freeze and that the shares are actually held in a trust. The freeze shares are held in a trust. In the Tossie environment today, that trust is a little bit tougher to make work. If the uh, succession planning child is over the age of 25, maybe it's not too bad, but we still have to uh, watch that. Let's have a look at a melt and a thaw, or a wasting freeze and a thaw. So let's say here that uh, Bruce has at some point frozen his shares of Trashco, and now we have uh, Trashco owning the 300 uh, common shares, or sorry, Holdco owning the 300 common shares of Trashco, and Bruce owns, uh, just for the sake of argument here, uh, $6 million of preferred shares. And these preferred shares, as we've previously seen, fixed value shares, and we'll give them heavy voting rights and a fixed dividend. And just to make this fixed value work, uh, let's say that we valued the shares at $10,000 each. So that would be 600 shares at $10,000 each. And Kaylee has acquired some common shares here. Kaylee bought a nominal amount of common shares. She put $1,000 into Holdco and took back $1,000 of common shares. And Trashco is worth still $6 million. Technically, Holdco now has $6 million. This is not going to be... Um, terribly material, but six million and one thousand dollars of value. The six million dollars represented by Trash Coast shares plus the thousand dollars that Kaylee just injected here. If we're going to do this uh, melt or this wasting freeze, then what we might see here is maybe in year one of Bruce's retirement, and this is something where we'd have to work with our financial planner, so James would have to step in here and figure out how to best arrange this. And the way we're going to do this, maybe in year one, and probably this is done on a set schedule. Let's say that we're planning on a potential 40 year retirement for Bruce. And in year one then, uh, Trashco redeems 15 of Bruce's shares. And technically, sorry, it would be Holdco, I should be clear here. Holdco redeems 15 of uh, Bruce's shares. And that's 600 divided by uh, 40 years. That would be 15 shares a year. That's going to eventually get Bruce out of the picture. If he dies early, then that's going to be dealt with. As we've seen earlier, that's going to be all taxed based on his death. And ideally, we have some insurance in hold code to exercise a share redemption there. So Holdco redeems 15 of Bruce's shares. Uh, the value is $10,000 each. So $10,000 times 15, that's going to be $150,000 of shares that we're going to uh, redeem here. And it's going to have to pay that as a taxable dividend to Bruce. Now, Bruce is not going to have a capital gain on that. We'll still have that same uh, provision we've previously seen with share redemption, that there would be um, no 
there, ultimately there would be no tax to pay on the capital gain because the uh, proceeds of disposition here are the same as the dividend payable. So Bruce doesn't have any uh, tax to pay on the capital gain, but he does have to tax to pay on the dividend. So that's taxable. And then we would just keep going like that. And just for the sake of argument, let's look at 10 years later. And 10 years later now, we have uh, Bruce has redeemed now 150 of his shares. He still owns 450 of them, and they have a value of four and a half million dollars. If Trashco still has a six million dollar valuation at this point, and let's say just to keep it simple that that's true, then Kaylee's shares are now worth, even without any growth in the company, Kaylee's shares are now worth one million. 500 and technically we shouldn't forget about that $1,000 that they were originally worth. Kaylee's shares have grown in value just by taking Bruce out of the mix here. And Bruce would have taken this one and a half million dollars that he generated over this time and bought other retirement assets. That's the, uh, so that's the melt or the wasting freeze. And then a thaw, in a thaw, we would have potentially something similar here where we have Bruce and just like we had a second ago, he's got all those shares with heavy voting rights. And the easiest thing for him to do here, if uh, Kaylee has something go wrong, she turns out to be a flake or she doesn't know how to run the business or she uh, maybe fights with Bruce, as we sometimes see in family businesses, whatever it is that goes wrong, Bruce simply exercises his voting rights. He fires Kaylee from her responsibilities in the business. Getting her out of her ownership position might be a little bit tougher. And he resumes control of the business. Now this is not going to be easy uh, first off, we probably just ruined Christmas, but in addition to the family strife that arises, it would not be uncommon. If Kaylee feels hard done by here, she might actually pursue legal action against Bruce, and this is where we get into a whole complicated area of law called minority shareholder oppression or minority shareholder rights. And this is where uh, Kaylee can basically say, look, even though I didn't have a controlling interest in this business. Uh, Bruce, the majority shareholder, is doing something that will actually impoverish me, which is somewhat contrary to the intent of my investment in this corporation. Kaylee might have a case here, although minority shareholder rights are extremely difficult to enforce, but it is something to think about. We can't just steamroll shareholders, even if they're in a minority position. Okay, I hope that that's reasonably clear. That's our uh, melt and our thaw. Bruce has done a thaw here, put himself back in control. I hope you're uh, enjoying the video series here and enjoy your continued studies. Thank you very much.